All right, my friends, it's time to rethink whole life insurance. It's uh, this time to do it. Now is literally now is the time to do it. Doesn't mean you go buy a policy. It just means you get some knowledge on how whole life works because it is very very important. It's a very good product, not great, good. Um, it can be well. It's just so whole. There's two types of permanent insurance. One is whole life. Is literally there for your whole life. You make the premiums. The insurance company is obligated contractually to make sure they give you a baseline level of cash value, value and a baseline level of death benefit. There's, there's, there's no two ways around that. Now, you might make more cash value and a bigger death benefit if the insurance company has higher interest rates it can give, if the insurance company is good at investing the premiums you make, if your cost of insurance goes down for whatever reason, insurance company becomes more efficient. You don't want to guarantee or rely on that, but it could happen. In fact, it does more often than not. It doesn't mean it will, but that's whole life. Universal life is something different. Universal life, the risk is on you. Whole life, the risk is on the insurance company. Universal life, the risk is on you. And I'm not a big fan of universal life because I've seen it. Um, the policies blow up a lot at the worst possible time. You know, a 77 year old guy, a colonel in the, in the army got out, did not get the survivor benefit on his military pension. He said, I'm going to buy a universal life policy instead in the mid 1990s. The insurance rates, the, uh, the, the interest rates just went down for 20 years. The policy is now basically about to expire for him to keep that policy active in which to provide his wife a death benefit at his demise. He's going to have to come up with a whole lot of money, to keep that policy active. And I've seen it happen more often. I just, it's disgusting. That's universal life. Whole life insurance is like that. Whole life is different. It's there again for your whole life. As long as you make the minimum contractual obligations, the risk is on the insurance company. With that said, when the interest rates are so low, whole life doesn't look that attractive. It just doesn't. You're not making that much, uh, hardly enough to even keep up with the cost of insurance. So it doesn't look that good. Now the interest rates are higher. Uh, this becomes a lot more attractive. So I just want to kind of show you something here. I thought I kind of chuckled at this. Dave Ramsey hates whole life. Uh, whole life is ever is whole life ever a good idea? Heated debate between whole life agent and Dave Ramsey. The whole life insurance scam. A lot of people do. Whole life insurance is a ripoff. My term is barren whole life. Anyway, there's a lot of negatives on, on whole life insurance, and sadly, a lot of it's self deserved because I just watched a guy on LinkedIn. Oh, I'm like, dude, I mean, the insurance is a good product. Not great, but good. And you got these guys, it's like snake oil salesman, man. I'm just like, oh, John Rockefeller, the senior John Rockefeller, not John Rockefeller, you know, J.D. Rockefeller. His dad was literally a snake oil salesman, just let FYI. It's kind of weird how his dad was a snake oil salesman, and then all of a sudden John Rockefeller became one of the richest men ever in the history of mankind. Yeah, nothing satanic about that at all, and we're still living under the iron fist of the Rockefellers. Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Eh, whatever, dude. You can say that all you want. You're wrong. I'm a conspiracy factualist. That's a damn thing. All right, but anyway, so whole life, and um, but then you got these guys that are peddling whole life insurance, kind of like solar panels and aluminum siding salesmen. It's just, oh, it's embarrassing. I'm doing a video, big guy. But I, I want to show you. So a guy sent me this. Let me get a guy sent me this uh, policy illustration. And he said, hey, Josh, what do you think, man? Whole life. I said, look, I'm not, a, I'm not anti whole life in the least. Let me take a look. And uh, so he's basically he's 51 years old, you know, a year younger than me. He's a whippersnapper. He's going to put $50,000 a year into a whole life policy. Now, before you say, I can't afford 50,000 bucks, it's all relative, dude. I mean, you might be able to afford 5,000. I don't know. But he's got positive cash flow because he's in his prime earning uh, income years. That's kind of like me, too. And, uh, and I'm not doing a 401k. And I'm actually somewhat anti. Uh, uh, investments anymore not 100 percent, but i'm just like yeah i like the idea of a whole life policy especially i'm in my early 50s so my underwriting would be pretty good i'd probably qualify for pretty good underwriting and have positive cash flow all right so anyway so he's gonna put two hundred fifty thousand bucks in notice at the end of year five his two hundred fifty thousand, if he were to decide to sell this whole thing would only be worth 243 all right so he didn't make any money there that's a fact because the cost of insurance the commissions got paid for the sales guys all that uh, but he still has a death benefit of 830000 bucks. So if he died at the end of year five, his wife would get $830,000 tax-free. He put in two fifty, his wife's get eight thirty. The internal rate of return on the death benefit would be 43%. Now, he's not likely to die in year five. Uh, if he were, he, you know, <laughs> you should see the IRR in a term policy. <laughs> but I like that. I like how they have the IRR and the death benefit because I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty interesting concept.
which I used to use a lot when I was doing second and die life insurance because people get it. Uh, but anyway, you can see IR, internal rate of return on his cash value is nothing. He's losing money. Now, we fast forward to year 10. His 250 is now worth 301. All right. I don't like this annual cash surrender value uh, in, uh, increases. I, I just I don't like that um, because a lot of whole life insurance people say, oh, you can access 10,000 a year tax free for the rest of your life or 60,000 a year tax. -free. I, I, I hate that. The drawback about whole life is if the policy begins to look like it's going to lapse because you've been pulling money out of there, you're either going to have to bring a whole lot to the table to keep the policy in force or it's going to be a massive tax hit. And the same thing happens in universal life policies too, but we're talking whole life right now. A massive tax hit. Yeah, you got to be careful there, man. So when they start selling you all this tax-free income, ugh, that makes me very nervous, very nervous. All right, so right here, he put 250 in. It's worth 301. If he were to surrender the entire of the policy, he'd have to pay ordinary income tax. <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> On the difference between his cash surrender value and his basis. So his ordinary income, he'd have to pay tax on is roughly 51,000 bucks. That's ordinary income. The rest of this is a return of principal. All right. So, but if he doesn't surrender it, he's got 301,000 bucks and he dies, his wife will get 566. She doesn't get 566 plus 301. She gets 566. All right. That's it. And you're still, that's still an internal rate of return on the death benefit, 10% a year. That's not too shabby. Now here's where it gets interesting. He's got 301,000 bucks. The next year, you'll have 315000 bucks, according to this illustration, which I'll talk about in just a second, the difference between a guaranteed and a non-guaranteed illustration. That's an increase of cash value with no premiums of $14,000. All right, $14,000 divided into 301, because we take 315 minus, so we take now minus previous divided by previous, and we have an in, uh, increase uh, by 4.57 on that cash value. 4.57 that's all tax-free by the way because now to pay tax on it again if it, he leaves it to his wife she doesn't have to pay tax on it he has access to this tax-free as long as you position it a certain way again i just caution you on not falling for you can take sixty thousand a year tax-free i just i get real nervous on that um anyway so his annual uh, cash surrender value increase well there it is it increased by thirteen thousand okay there it is right there thirteen thousand eight hundred fifty is what it increased by cool so he, his cash value grew by 4.5%. Interesting. Now, notice it never really grows more than that. 4.7, 4.7. That's not so bad, though. It's all growing tax-free. If you had a tax-equivalent yield, that would be, you know, 6, 7, 8% if you factor a taxable account. Uh, if he dies in year 19, his wife gets 694. His IRR and the death benefit would be 6.17. It's pretty good. He put 250 in. She gets 694. That averaged 6.1% a year until he's dead. We don't want that to happen. So instead, we're going to say he has $455,000 of cash value, which he can access. $200,000 will be taxable as ordinary income. $250,000 will be his return of principal. So you'd have to work with the insurance company to make that as beneficial as you can from a tax perspective. Which means his IRR on the growth of that cash value is 3.58 from the very beginning. All right, so from zero, and he put 50000 a year until now, is 3.58. Once that sucker is funded, though, which it is here, he's averaging 4% a year on increases on those cash values, tax-free. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. No risk to him either. Now, this isn't the guaranteed, so let's check this out. All right, so here's the uh, non There's a guaranteed right here. So in year 18, he's guaranteed to have $284,000 of cash value. Now, he put $250,000 in. So you're like, oh, dude, that's not that great. Yeah, likelihood of it being guaranteed. Like the insurance companies that we used to represent at USA, they never had just guaranteed. I mean, anything could happen, and it could. I'm not this, But this is the baseline. This is literally the worst case scenario that you know. You put $250,000 in, you get $284,000 guaranteed in year 18. Um, when you're 68 years old or a $455,000 death benefit, all right? That's a guarantee. That's the worst case scenario. A non-guarantee, which is probably more likely, especially with higher interest rates, you got uh, 434 of cash value in year 18 and 677 of death benefit. Now, again, I can't say this is going to come to fruition. We don't know. We don't know. But at least we have a line in the sand to know for a fact that when you're uh, year 18, you'll have no less than $284,000 of cash value. 
and again, only thirty four thousand of that is is, uh, is income or interest that you made. So it's not a great investment. But people say, "Oh my goodness, stocks will do so much better." Or something like that. I'm like, "Really? I'm really? Because what's the market is doing?" And here's the issue: whole life back in the day, for the last basically fifteen years, was nothing, man. It's just because the interest rates are so low. But now the interest rates are so high, and they're not going down anytime soon. The whole life looks a lot more attractive, especially for a safe investment because it's guaranteed by the insurance company. That doesn't mean the insurance companies can't go bankrupt. But I tell you, if insurance companies go bankrupt, the whole, in, I mean, you got you got homeowners insurance, you got auto insurance, you got life insurance, you got insurance on this, insurance on that. If insurance companies start going bankrupt, the whole thing, concept of insurance is done. Health insurance, we're all screwed. So not, I mean, again, anything could happen, not likely. So it's quite a safe investment has a tax-free component of growth of your dollar, of the, your cash value. Also has a death benefit as well. Is it the most efficient investment? Well, what is the most efficient investment? A VTI, the total stock index, well, it's efficient going up and it's efficient going down. And it can. It went down 57% from 2007 to 2009. So what is efficient? Okay. I mean, give me a freaking break. I hate that crap. Oh, my goodness, my VTI. Yeah, I get it. Over the last, you know, basically since 1920, the markets freaking took off like a bat out of hell. And then you start thinking, but why did they take off like a bat out of hell? Oh, because we electrified everything. The 1921, we had the Highway uh, trans, well, the uh, Federal Highway Act, which put highways all over the United States. So we could move product over the road by trucks and get rid of our reliance on trains. Because remember, the trains were corrupt as could be. They still are kind of. I mean, look at that. Why do you think Warren Buff is so adamant against pipelines? Because, you know, pipelines would compete against trains. You think Warren Buffett cares two things about the environment? No. No. He owns Norfolk Southern or some company, whatever. The, I, I think it might be. He doesn't care about the environment. He cares about the trains, man. He wants to be the only game in town. So over the road truck, and we're able to bring products from point A to point B efficiently, quickly. Uh, and then you got refrigeration as well. And this is just off the back of what we used to have horse and buggies, dude. So you have mass, mass electrification. Mass internal combustion engines, mass roads to put move product from point A to point B. The technological improvements were so amazing from that base that 30 year time frame from 1900 to 1930. It's insane, dude. Yeah, Eric, uh, climate controlled homes. I mean, it's just, it's nuts. It's nuts. Then after World War II, we were the only game in town. All right. So then we did all the manufacturing because no one else was, they were just rebuilding to put houses on the ground in Germany and Japan and whatnot. And then you go into the, the Nixon in China, you know, where we're selling our slow souls for slave labor in the in the in China, and whatnot. Well, that was a boon for uh, for the corporate America, as a fact. So you had electrification, you had mass building of roads, mass ability to move product from point A to point B by a turbo combustion engine, huge. And then you had us as the only game in town post World War II, and then you had mass globalization. That's what led the boom of the last hundred centuries of the, the stock market. I don't think that's going to continue. Now we're pushing EVs. And now we're pushing solar panels. These are not an improvement in efficiency, man. They're not. They're, they're devolving. This is a fact. We're devolving from the ability to go from horse and buggy to an ICE is a jump in a, a factor of 10. Going from an ICE to an EV is devolving from 10 to 8. I mean, that's just a fact. Going from uh, coal, nuclear, and uh, natural gas electricity to solar panels and wind turbines is devolving as well. And battery back. It's stupid. We are not going to have the same level of returns in stocks for the next 50 years. I mean, we could. But if we don't, and we're looking at, okay, stocks still continue to carry a significant amount of risk, man, whole life insurance becomes a whole lot more valuable, in my opinion. So if you're in your high cash earning years, you know, late 40s, early 50s, man, I think you got to revisit this, dudes. Really, you should. And start squirreling. I said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start squirreling a bunch of money in there. Now, I don't know what your cash scenario is, but man, you got to be healthy, though. Remember, you got to get underwritten. No, you don't want to be smoking. You don't want to be 50 pounds overweight. I mean, because your health, life insurance is, con is contingent on your ability to live a long time. So the insurance company doesn't have to pay you that fast. Because remember, when you see an IRR, you see a cumulative internal rate of return on your death benefit at 10.63 percent that's a hit to the insurance company i mean that's literally what they are paying you if you died in your tent so they want to make sure that you're not going to die too quickly if that makes sense they got to get paid so if they if they find that you're a high risk they're going to charge you a higher premium which would make this not as valuable for sure so you want to be in better shape 
you, know, you certainly don't want to be smoking and jump out of planes with a helicopter without a, a parachute. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing on, on the jabs. I know insurance companies have made a, a kind of a, a they made some noise about the jabs. I'm not sure what their take on that is now. Probably they, they have to. I'm sure there's some law that says you can't discriminate. But anyway, if I was an insurance company, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, we're going to look at your jab status. Anyway, so think about it. You know, tell Dave Ramsey to pound sand. I mean, if you don't know what you're talking about, dude, don't be an idiot. Say insurance companies' a, whole life is a scam. It's freaking not a scam. I know he's got to do that for clicks. I get it, but it's so freaking stupid. All right, love your thoughts. We'll see you.